Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and I'd like to thank the San Clemente City Council for, um, uh, for having me make this presentation to you. I have to apologize, my voice is a little squeaky today. Um, with the change of seasons here in Vermont, I appear to have picked up a virus, but I'll be okay. I'd like to talk to you today about the lessons that Fukushima should have taught us, but didn't. The first one of those is something called the design bases. Now what that means is, what do we expect Mother Nature can throw at us? Now for instance, a plant built in California is built for a, a, a stronger earthquake than a plant built in Vermont. A plant built in Florida is built for a stronger hurricane than a plant in upstate New York. So, that's called the design basis. What do we think Mother Nature can throw at us? Now, in law, that comes from 10 CFR, 10 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 50, Appendix A, which is something called the General Design Criteria. And General Design Criteria number two talks about design bases. But it's interesting, it's, it's deliberately vague, and um, there's no, um, no mathematical number to support the fact that um, you know, an earthquake must be this strong or a, a hurricane wind must be this strong. It's not in law. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission takes that general design criteria and, and basically says we believe it's a good thing to build a plant for the worst thing that Mother Nature can throw at us in about a thousand years. They go back over the historical record and they're supposed to find the worst thing that Mother Nature can, can do over the last thousand years of the geologic record. Now, I don't think that's happened. And the first lesson of, of Fukushima that we're not really learning is we need to look at, again, what we think is the worst Mother Nature can throw at us. For example, the tsunami at, at Fukushima was, uh, was well outside the design bases. Well, so was the earthquake at Fukushima. And some equipment in Unit 2, or Unit 1 rather, appears to have been damaged from the earthquake before the tsunami. And, and two other events in the last six months also bump right up against the design bases. One is the flood out in, um, out in the Midwest at Fort Calhoun, and the other is the earthquake on the East Coast at North Anna. Now all of these were right at or over what we thought the worst that Mother Nature could do to us in, the, in, in a thousand years. Now that four of these, two earthquakes, Japan and, and, and Virginia, a flood and, uh, and a tsunami, that all of them occurred in six months tells me that we really haven't anticipated what Mother Nature can really do. Now, let's do, some, let's do the math here. The math is that you know, once in a thousand years sounds like a long time, but really if a nuclear plant runs for 60 years, put 60 in the numerator and then in the denominator put a thousand and you wind up with a 6% chance that any nuclear plant over its lifetime will see an event as bad or worse than the design bases. 6% for San Onofre. 6% for Diablo Canyon, 6% for plants here in Vermont. Well, on top of that, there's about 60 nuclear sites. So if you take that 6% and multiply by 60 sites, you get about 360%. In other words, it's a near certainty that some plant in the United States over its lifetime will experience an event worse than designers anticipated. Matter of fact, more like three or four plants in the United States over their 60-year life will experience an event worse than the designers anticipated. Now, it's interesting though that what the designers anticipate and what independent science anticipate are two different things. And it really boils down to cost. The stronger you make a plant, the more costly it becomes. So a plant in California costs more than a plant in the East Coast because earthquakes are stronger in California. But a plant in Florida 
anticipates that it'll get hit by a, a stronger hurricane than the, than the winds you might anticipate in um, upstate New York. Now, outside independent experts actually have anticipated that we really haven't designed for the worst, ca worst case. There were experts in Japan who said that the geologic record indicated three tsunamis as bad or worse than the one that hit them over a 2,000 year period. So experts in Japan outside of the utility that owned the plant were predicting that a tsunami could hit. That wasn't just a 45 foot tsunami, but could even be higher based on the record. Those experts were ignored. So as much as the design bases um, probably has been, been missed at least four times by industry experts, I think if you talk to independent experts, they'll tell you that it's highly likely that a much worse event than what we've anticipated could occur. You know, for instance, at San Onofre, San Onofre is designed for a one-foot tsunami. Now, on top of that, San Onofre has added a margin so they can withstand about a six-foot tsunami. But on the other side of the ocean, they had a 45-foot tsunami. I think there's experts who would say that a six-foot tsunami is probably not adequate for San Onofre. Well, there's two things we can do to avoid this problem, neither of which is being done. We can set a higher threshold. Rather than once in a thousand years, we can say once in 10,000 year event. Or we can listen to independent experts as opposed to industry experts when we're designing the plant. But whatever we do on design bases, I think it's important to remember that it boils down to money. The stronger the plant is to, design, to, to withstand what Mother Nature throws at us, the more likely it is to become cost prohibitive. The second thing I think we need to learn and haven't is, has to do with emergency planning. And within that, there's two parts. If there's an accident, who pays? And if there's an accident, who's in charge? Well, Tokyo Electric is worth about $100 billion. The event in Japan is going to cost about $250 billion. So Tokyo Electric is probably going to be driven into bankruptcy in the, as, as they pay for this. They're going to have to sell their assets. And the rest is going to be borne by the Japanese people. Now, in the United States, it's different. We have something called Price Anderson, and that limits the liability to the company that, uh, that has the accident to about $10 billion. And the remainder, $240 billion, would be borne by taxpayers. It would be the biggest industrial accident that's ever occurred in the United States. Now, within the United States, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has allowed something to happen uh, which actually minimizes costs, it makes it impossible to go back at most of the utilities that own power plants. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has allowed them to become limited liability corporations. Now, what that means is, uh, let's take Illinois, for example. Uh, Exelon has uh, 17 power plants, most in Illinois. And each individual power plant is a limited liability corporation. So if a power plant has, a, has an accident, it has no more assets. And the other power plants are not the cause of the accident. Therefore, they don't have to carry the bill. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has allowed this to happen by changing the licenses of power plants. They used to be owned by utility companies, and there were assets behind them. Now each nuclear plant is a limited liability corporation. Who pays is a really good question. The second question then is who's in charge? In Japan, I think you've noticed the, the uh, confusion about who's in charge. And I'd submit to you that the Japanese are the best prepared in the event of an emergency. They really took emergency planning seriously for years because they had earthquakes frequently. And even now, clearly, no one really knows who's in charge of cleaning up northern Japan and who's in charge of cleaning up the site. It's interesting, I've noticed as I've studied accidents over time that when an accident happens, 
the plant management recognizes really quickly that things are really bad. At Three Mile Island, the plant manager at 7.30 in the morning wanted to declare uh, an emergency and evacuate. Now he called the people at the home office about 150 miles away and they talked him down from that. At, at Chernobyl, the same thing happened. The plant management understood that, that things were really bad, but yet the bureaucracy didn't really recognize it and didn't spread the word. And, and of course at Fukushima we have exactly the same problem. The plant management wanted to inject salt water. They needed to inject salt water. And yet higher ups in the chain of command in Tokyo told, told the plant manager not to. He's a hero. He did what had to be done despite the fact that, that the government told him not to. You get this situation where the people on the ground know how bad things are, but yet further up the chain of command, people don't make the right decisions. In Japan, the Fukushima prefecture, like a state, had potassium iodine pills available. What they do is they block the radiation that goes to your thyroid. They were stocked and they were ready to be used, but the state was prohibited from using them by the national government in Tokyo. It wasn't for seven days until the national government realized that they should release these potassium iodide pills. Again, the people on the ground really recognize the severity of the problem, but when larger organizations get involved, the time to respond lengthens and puts lives at risk. Now, in the United States, the situation's probably even worse. The Japanese understood how to do emergency planning and they still didn't do it right. Here we probably have five different entities that would be perhaps in charge. First would be the utility. Second would be the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Environmental Protection Agency. FEMA. And, and then also it's possible that the state could also say it's our job. So we have five different organizations. FEMA can't do it. FEMA is prohibited by, by law um, to, to be involved for more than 30 days, something called the Stafford Act. And so they're out of the picture. After Three Mile Island, the utility was in charge briefly and then the Nuclear Regulatory Commission came in and reported directly to the President of the United States. Now that's not part of any law or any plan. And I'd submit to you that allowing the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to be in charge is not the best thing to do if you're concerned about the health and welfare of the people surrounding San Clemente and the San Onofre plant. The reason is that right now there's a battle between the EPA and the NRC over the exposure to people after an accident. The NRC wants a hundred times higher exposures to the population after an accident than does the EPA. To get an idea about what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission really plans to do after a severe accident, it's a good idea to look at a computer code they use called the MAX2 computer program. M-A-C-C-S-2. It's used to determine the costs and benefits to society and whether or not a utility has to um, implement changes to their design in order to minimize the cost to you and I. It was designed not for a nuclear power plant accident but for a dirty bomb and the designer has actually renounced the program for the use the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is using. What are some of the assumptions they have in the code? They only look at some forms of cancer, not all, and they also don't look at other health effects caused by radiation. For instance, cesium attacks children's hearts and doesn't cause cancer, but it causes heart attacks and heart ailments. The code does not evaluate that. They assume that the radiation that lands on a field will be plowed under. There's no attempt by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to clean the fields after a nuclear accident. They hose down the houses and let that water run into the rivers. And interestingly, if it lands on a forest, they don't plan to touch the forest. The contamination will stay there until it decays in 300 years. 
This MAX program takes into account no storage of radioactive material. There's no attempt to put radioactive material into drums and store it until it decays away. Basically, the NRC is assuming that it stays on the ground and in the ground until 300 years are up and the cesium has disappeared. The program assumes that all the radiation, once it comes out of the reactor, stays on the ground and doesn't get resuspended. So a car on a dusty road throwing up dust is not included in the calculation. Probably the, the um, most illogical uh, assumption in the computer program is that they assume the accident lasts for two and a half hours. Yes, two and a half hours. Now, Fukushima has been releasing radiation for seven months, but the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in their severe accident code assumes the releases occur for two and a half hours. They also assume that not much fuel is damaged so that the releases are nowhere near as, as severe as Fukushima. They assume that the wind blows in a straight line. And as you look at the, the maps of contamination that came out of Fukushima, that's clearly not true either. And last but not least, they give the owner, the plant owner, the option of paying compensation or cleaning up. Compensation is always cheaper than cleanup. And so when the Nuclear Regulatory Commission runs this program, compensating somebody for their loss on average is, is always much cheaper than cleaning up. And that always turns out to be the direction the decisions are made. So this MAX-2 program is designed to, to talk about costs and benefits to society. Now, even with all of these um, assumptions, which minimize the benefits to society, the MAX code has actually predicted some changes should be made. At Indian Point, it was discovered by the state of New York that 14 times the MAX code said these changes are cost beneficial. The state wrote to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about this, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission responded saying, they are required by law to evaluate, to consider the changes, but they, even if they're cost beneficial, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission isn't required to implement the changes. I teach math at the local college here in Burlington. And one of the things I teach is GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. What that means is that the output of a computer program is only as good as the information that goes into it. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission puts the lowest value on a human life of any agency in, in Washington. It assumes the human life is worth $3 million. Other agencies are 5 to $9 million. So with all the assumptions I just talked about, plus a low value of a human life, it's very unlikely that the NRC will force a utility to make modifications, and it's very unlikely that you'd really want them to be the agency in charge in the event of a nuclear accident. The person who wrote the MAX code is a guy named David Shannon. And he has renounced it. I wanted to share with you his own words about the code and how it's being improperly used. Quote, even in 1975, the cost numbers were underestimated to a significant degree. The underestimation is much more significant today. Unquote. Quote, there are quite a few things that never made sense to me, but Sandia National Labs was directed by the NRC to continue using the prior approach. Unquote. And the final quote is, it seems to me that the code's quality assurance shortcomings and the lack of input justifications are again being ignored. Unquote. This MAX-2 computer program is the key decision-making tool that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uses when they make decisions about whether a plant should be licensed for an extra 20 years, or when they make decisions about when a safety modification is necessary. Well, as I said before, GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. The code is only as good as the input assumptions that go into it. 
minimize the human life or assume the cleanup is minimal and you'll justify very, very few safety modifications, which is what the NRC does pretty routinely. Interestingly though, as I said in New York State, a letter to the, uh, to the state of New York from the NRC says there's been 50 times when the MAX-2 computer code has determined that a safety modification would be beneficial. And yet the NRC has ignored it even when its code shows that a safety modification is necessary. The real problem then lies with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and how it implements safety modifications. Not only does the Nuclear Regulatory Commission see no accidents, hear no accidents, speak about no accidents, but I think there's a fourth monkey too, and that's that they believe no accident can occur. And if that's the case, I submit to you that an accident is likely to happen because our regulator isn't enforcing the regulations that are on the books. I'd like to thank the San Clemente City Council for having me tonight. If you have any further questions or would like to study this even more, uh, there are other videos on the Fairwinds website. Thank you.